Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Katie Stewart and I am Professor of Marketing Management at West Shore Community College. This evening's event, Tales of Scotland with Dr. Margaret Bennett, is brought to you via Zoom by West Shore Community College's Humankind series. For those of you not familiar with the series, our goal is to explore the question, what does it mean to be human? In previous years, we've taken that question to places like Cuba, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. This academic year, we're focused on the British Isles, which are made up of countries like Scotland, Ireland, England, and Wales. I have really been looking forward to this event this evening. I am honored to introduce to you all tonight, Dr. Margaret Bennett, all the way from Creef, Scotland. She is one of Scotland's most distinguished folklorists, an award-winning author, a professor at the Royal Scottish Academy, and an inductee of the Scottish Traditional Music Hall of Fame for her many contributions to Gaelic music. Tonight, Margaret will share some of the old Scottish customs and songs that are part of the way of life in Scotland, and maybe even one or two that we might recognize here in the United States. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a little bit later in the evening for you than us. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. And if only seeing you in this way, but it's certainly better than not seeing anybody at all, that would be. And um, I love the opening there. What does it mean to be human? And I'm going to be thinking about that as well as I share a few things with you tonight. I'm going to share my screen. I hope that'll just take me a second because I thought I'd like to meet somewhere on this screen and I'll just um, share it and then go on to a slideshow and you can let me know, Katie, if you can see. Okay. I thought I might begin by bringing you to where I began my home island because if you haven't been well in fact a lot of people in scotland have never been but let's just set off it's quite astonishing that there's three and a half thousand miles between the two people sitting on your screen katie stewart margaret bennett and i'm also quite excited that my family are actually stewards from the island of sky i don't know if i told you that three and a half thousand miles. And here we are connected. The British Isles, that's your area of study this year. Scotland um, is that little purple bit at the top. It's nothing to do with how it actually looks. It just is the way it's represented on that page. And we only have, oh, just under 6 million people. Whereas our larger neighbor, England has almost 10 times that number of people. So of course, it's much more densely populated and Ireland. And um, if we always consider that little stretch of water between Ireland and Scotland as, as a highway that joins us rather than a sea that separates us and the other Celtic nation, Wales. So let's set off and I'm going to take you, oops, where's that next one? To the island of Skye. It was one of those little small islands on the west coast. It's quite mountainous and picturesque. And believe it or not, the one in the middle at the bottom is the scene from my that my mother grew up looking at across from where they lived. Yes, it's, that area there is not a castle. It's actually a natural landscape. It's, it's a rather spectacular place. And we used to call it the Fairy Glen. Perhaps when you look at it, it might be for obvious reasons. We could walk across, well, we, we would go to the bottom of what we call a croft, a little small farm and across the river. And my mother said that in her day, the favorite pastime was to count the hillocks because her mother told them that there was 365 hillocks, one for every day of the year. 
But you know, she said, we never did get to count them because you'd count, then you'd lose count and you'd manage, you say, now did we count that one? And it was impossible. But of course it really was just a little game, but they did believe there were fairies down there. And there were accounts of people who met them. I didn't, but I'm not arguing. That would, I, I have listened to the stories and including from my grandmother. So the, 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 the area was this little area here. You can see, this is our little map of Scotland. And that there little red bit is the island of Skye, the winged island. So I thought, well, if I'm going to bring you there, I might as well take you to the very place where it all began. This is my grandfather. Yes, and even at the age of 80, he's stacking the hay with the rest of the corn. My grandmother at the bottom here with her, rake, her hay fork and my mother's brother, Peter, with a horse, the old Clydesdale horse and a sleigh. They did get a tractor, but the horse was what they used for generations. And this is my mother, her name, Peggy Stewart. And since Katie is there, this is John Stewart, Flora Stewart, Peter Stewart, Peggy Stewart, Katie Stewart there. So off we set. And the home on the hearth, oh, we, I've lost a, a little picture, I think, but the fuel was peat. You may have noticed there were no trees, and there, well, there are trees in some parts of Scotland, but they cut peat um, with a spade and it dried it. It would start about May and then stacked it for the winter. And that stack is a sort of typical peat stack beside a house. And that's the fuel to keep you going over the winter. But you would also use it in the summer because in fact, there was no electricity on the island until I was about seven. So I'd gone to school by the time we got electricity and we were quite used to, you don't miss what you don't have. And I think that's quite good to remember. Um, and you don't feel poor unless somebody says, gosh, you people are really poor. But if they keep reminding you, then you certainly feel that way. But we didn't. We didn't feel that way at all. Um, and it was a very um, simple way of life. Lots of work, but lots of contentment. Now, I had a photograph there that seems to have vanished, but it was my uncle feeding the sheep and spinning. Something has gone wrong with my slideshow because the pictures are not as clear as I hoped. However, I'm hoping this one will work because I filmed my mother talking to so her. And that's the glen. My mother and me of Ashke, uh, the loan, 20 think. years ago. No, yeah. oh. Oops, I'll, I'll, sorry, oops. I'll, I'll, I'll put it back a second. We're talking Gaelic. Gaelic was the language of the area. My mother had no English till she went to school and neither did any of her brothers and sisters. They spoke only Gaelic at home. And when they went to school at the age of five, they soon learned it. And of course, we learned it as well. And in fact, we spoke English at home because my father didn't speak it. But that is the, the, the landscape. You can see it behind her. And she's telling about how her mother used to keep them from going in the river the dangers of the river so she said and she's going to translate it for you i just know that so she used to say to us i know she will fast get it alone i no pity in your house which means of course don't go near the burn or the water horse will get you yes. and of course we were scared stiff of this water horse what did it look like in your mind? well i don't know something like a sea lion or something like that I, I, was it big so well, of course, because we were little and this was a huge monster. <laughs> Maybe something like, like the Loch Ness monster in a child's mind. And would it come out in your mind, come out of the water? Oh, well, we never saw it because we were too scared to go too near. So there's the river. She was telling us that her mother said, don't go near the river or the water horse will get you. This was a huge monster and it would come out of the house and out of the river and it would steal children, drag you into the river. It was monstrous and drown you. Don't go there. And I said, what did it look like? Oh, she said, we never saw it. We were far too scared to go near the river. And of course, you can understand that was what they told the children. And nobody went near as little children and nobody drowned in the river. Whereas it doesn't quite work that way when you say to children, now don't go near the river, you might fall in and drown. 
me? I don't think so. And that was, that was, um, but um, there was a certain part of them that, 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 well, as children do, you, you pay attention to these things. And so it was. And um, every year the island had a Highland Games. And I know that there's a Highland Games. Well, there's a Michigan Highland Games run by the St. Andrews Society. And although the Portree Highland Games, that's the main village of Sky, my father's in that pipe band, by the way. Um, uh, there was no point to point out, and this is an old picture and a new one. It's a very special event as all Highland Games are. It really was a gathering, but I was absolutely delighted in a way to discover that your Highland Games in Michigan is older than ours. Your Highland Games in Michigan began in 1849. The one on the Isle of Skye didn't begin until 1886. So in fact, it was the expatriate longing for the old country that had them set up Highland Games. And some of the oldest were in fact in in North America, the San Francisco one in 1836, and the one at Balmoral that the Queen goes to, that didn't start until shortly afterwards. But of course, it's an ancient, ancient tradition. And it goes back, oh, some say to the 14th and 15th century, when the great thing was feats of strength and running and, and feats of great skill. And indeed, they say that some of those sports are the predecessors to the Olympic Games. Such was the prestige attached to them. I mentioned that Sky didn't have electricity, not until I was seven at least. And this is a picture of the hydro dam. The terrain lends itself to such. My father was a civil engineer on this dam. And um, I remember going up that little vernacular railway here you, there was a little railway all the way up there sitting on a bag of cement and then a little railway took me up there when I was a very small girl and so he was the engineer on that and he's, he's in that photograph there at the bottom but he was also a very keen mountaineer which is why he went to he, he loved sky although he didn't originate there so there you have it we got electricity and that did rather change things, of course. Um, we were no longer sitting in the lamplight or candlelight, but nevertheless, um, we stayed there and, and much enjoyed. I asked my mother, by the way, about her childhood, which was, as you can see, uh, certainly not in, a, in, in any way uh, um, a time of luxury of any kind, really. They, they made everything they wore and fished, etc., And they worked hard. And I said, how would you sum up your childhood like that then? And she said, I had an idyllic childhood. Isn't it lovely? We didn't know the meaning of the word bored, she said. We had an idyllic childhood. And that wonderful contentment that comes with maybe having little, I think, is a, is a great gift. Well, in order to get a further education we had to leave the island it's a big shock for country girls or for boys to go to the city but there you have it the capital city of Scotland Edinburgh and indeed it's still a rather busy place although the streets are a lot quieter these days as we have a lockdown just now but everybody wants to visit the castle and St Giles Cathedral and so on however I did return to the countryside although I do teach in Glasgow now and I returned to an area which actually has a connection to your area. I believe you're not terribly far from Taymouth. Is that right? Taymouth, Michigan? Well, there's a Taymouth, Michigan. Somebody will know about it. And if not, you will have to find out after this. And it's got a connection to Scotland. Loch Tay. I'm going to, if you can, can you see the cursor? Loch Tay. Well, this loch, it's one of our longest lochs, it's in the highlands. Oops, go back, sorry about that. And I live down here. This is Loch Ern. So if I could fly over the hill and up here is the mouth of the Tay. And in the corner here, you will see Taymouth Castle. I'm going to refer to that castle again. It looks more, it's, that's it from the 
19th century. It's been modernized since then, but it goes back much older than that. It goes back to the 1500s when it was first built. And it was um, the site of a very, uh, some very sad stories, one of which I'll sing to you later on, but just keep it in mind just now. There's the connection, Taymouth. We both have a Taymouth, one in Michigan and one in Scotland. So there's a little, um, just an introduction to what does it mean to be human? That, that's what it meant to be human for my growing up. And although I did have a university education, I've often reflected that much of what I learned in the way of wisdom, I learned by the fireside. So welcome to the fireside. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and share with you some, some songs. And I was very interested in customs um, because I noticed when I was quite young, there's some things that I really don't understand. And I can remember the very first one that had me thinking, I'm not sure about what they tell you, you know? And <laughs> this was the 50s. And my three sisters and I were walking with my mother in the village. And coming towards us was a, a lovely young woman who'd been a school friend of my mother's. And she just had a new baby. And she was pushing this pram, as we call it. And of course, everybody stops to look at the new baby and oohs and ahs. And, and my mother, who had very, nobody had any money to speak of. And, it, and if you did, it had to be used just for the housekeeping. And there was also rationing, post-war rationing. She opened her, her purse in silence, took out the biggest coin that we have, which was called a half crown. And she pressed it into the little baby's hand now, nobody said thank you. My mother said nothing. And I thought, hmm, my mom can't afford to buy our sweets and she's giving away all that. And nobody said thank you. And I've been taught to say thank you. Well, I waited, thank goodness, till nobody was listening. I said, Mommy, about that half crown. Oh, yes, said my mother. You must always give a new baby a piece of silver. Oh, why? Well, silver is for luck, you know. And interestingly, when I was in Canada, I saw it, a silver dollar pressed into the hand or under the pillow of a new baby. I said, why did nobody say thank you? Well, that's just the way you do it, she said. You give the baby. And I said, for luck. But in fact, what we're looking at is something much, much older. And you may give a silver spoon or a little silver bracelet to a little new baby. But it goes back to an ancient, ancient custom, which we know has been handed down and slightly altered as the years go by. And that really, everything counted. They were rather afraid that you had to keep away the fairies and silver was one way of doing it. They had other ideas too. I wonder if any of you were named after or called after or called for somebody else. I have the same name as my mother. My mother is, has the same name as somebody. I don't know, Katie, if you were called the same name as somebody in your family, but a lot of people are called the same name as an uncle or a father or grandfather. And that too has an old tradition, which is, I think, again, connected with the fairies. They used to think that if you name the baby's name before the baptism and where the child was blessed, the fairies might hear you and steal your baby. And they would leave a changeling in its place. A changeling. What is a changeling? We have songs about that. I'll sing you one just now and then I'll tell you what a changeling is. And it's, I left my baby lying here lying here and when I came back I I searched everywhere my, the little brown otter's track not there where is my little baby and this is somebody who was out tending to our crops she turns around and her little one is gone so this is the song and it's sung actually as a lullaby and sung both in Gaelic and in Scots and it goes like this 
Ovan hovan korio ko, korio ko, korio ko. Ovan hovan korio ko, nor galav me rundum brulaken. Rak min shona hinige, nihinige, nihinige. Rak min shona hinige, nor galav me rundum brulaken. When I was doing some research for my book about customs, I wanted to know if anybody really could tell me what's a changeling anyway. Do you know that I found over 7,000 reports between, yes, of people who spoke about it, recorded between 1951 and 1992 when I wrote the book. I was astonished as you are. And especially when one man said, I saw one one time, you know. And I began to try and find out what is all this and what did the church have to say about this? But no other than the great Martin Luther, father of the Reformation, believed in changelings. And it's written in one of his journals. He says, and I'm quoting, what happened was the prince in Germany came to ask his advice. He had a changeling, he didn't know what to do. What should he do? And he said, I told the prince or ruler that he should put it in the river and drown it rather than keep the changeling. But the prince would not do as I said. So I asked him to say a pater noster daily, the Lord's prayer daily, and that, that the devil would be taken from him. And the said changeling died two years later. What is this? Well, we are looking at a time when there was no medical knowledge. And what we're looking at is a, is a genetic abnormality because they look at the child and they say, this little one is not anything like his six and seven brothers and sisters. He's different. He's smaller. Look at his head. It's large. Or look at his hands or look at his eyes. And we could be looking at anything from hydrocephalus, Down syndrome, or failure to thrive. And actually, I remember meeting, I, I had a, when my student job was at a, as a rehabilitation center for tiny children. And there was a little boy of five and he was the size of an 18 month old baby. And he could speak fluently and he was an absolute delight. It truly was. He didn't have a long lifespan, but I realized that this is what people called a changeling. He's not like any of his brothers and sisters, but they all had compensatory gifts they brought to the family. The family would thrive and have more than anyone else as long as the changeling was there. And it worked this way. When the cows went dry in the winter, they would say, you better take a pint of milk to the changeling, they'll have none. When the potatoes were short, send a bag of potatoes along because he can't farm. So everybody supplied them and that household was well loved. And so that's how it all worked. Lullabies were very important uh, in my childhood and in uh, my, my grandmother, according to my mother. Oh, she would think it'd be almost criminal to put your child down without singing to the baby and rocking him to sleep or her to sleep. Um, and I think it's that we talk now about the, the bonding between parents and it's that closeness because they all had rocking chairs. You have a lot of them in America, rocking chairs. I saw more on your side of the Atlantic than I've seen lately here. And there was always the fun too of dandling. That's the English word for when you take a small child on your knee and you sing to them and rhythmically. My grandfather was the expert and we absolutely loved it. This is a little song about you're going to get married. It's a teasing song. I think you have a girlfriend. I think you have a boyfriend. You're going to get married. And it was usually sung to a little child of say four or five and the child would be on like a horse. And you, so you sing like this. 
Tall pick and you cut and you cut and you cut, tall pick and you cut a stolikiri pose, tall pick and you cut and you cut and you cut, tall pick and you cut a stolikiri pose, mock feet and uncle lock yon lock of yon, and people could dance to them. We had little dance tunes like that. And they, the, they talk now about among storytellers, the way to tell your story or sing your song. And it's a great, it's a great lesson for parents, for teachers, for storytellers, for grandparents. And it's this, it's eye to eye and heart to heart. It's not via two things in your ears or via a device. It's eye to eye, heart to heart. And then you will have, a, what does it mean to be human? It means that somebody else cares enough to make you special enough to sing to them, to tell them a story. I, there are lots and lots of stories, of course, that we have. Um, I thought um, our greatest bard, of course, in Scots is Robert Burns. And I know that you probably have a Burns supper or a Robert Burns memorial of some kind. There are more statues of Robert Burns in the world than any other person who lived except Jesus, except Christ, or except Mary. There are more statues of, there's no, hardly any statues of Shakespeare, Dante, but Robert Burns, there are statues everywhere in the world. And I wonder why that was. It was because he, rather like Martin Luther King had this, had this great thing about equal, equality, justice, civil rights, human rights, fairness, comradeship, and not getting above your station. He wrote a poem or a song, it is, a man's a man for all that. It doesn't matter who you are. We won't take our estimate of you by your costly clothes. It's by your heart and who you are and your honesty. So, but he was also a great, um, a great uh, maker of love songs. So I'm going to sing one. The one, this is one that, he made when he was about 16, and he was still at school actually, he had a very good education. His father had a tutor for him. And he said he had been in the harvest field and had his eyes had alighted upon this wonderful vision of loveliness. And he, he said, I couldn't concentrate on my signs and cosines for thinking of her and then he said he went out into the sunshine but he couldn't sleep at night either this was like, almost like an affliction his is his brother gilbert said of robert robert was always tormented by <laughs> by some fair <laughs> creature however let's not go there but i'll sing you the song and it's got some scots words in it walking means awakened I means always, so I walk and oh, I'm always awakened. Sleep I can get none for thinking of my dearie. So I'm, and the word for I is e, and the word to cry or weep is greet. So that's your vocabulary for a start. So here's the song. I walk and oh, walk and I. And we sleep, I can get nain for thinking, oh, my dearie, I walk and oh, lonely night comes in, oh, the veil is sleeping, oh, but sleep, I can get nain. I bleed my in with greeting. I walk in oh, walk in I and weary sleep I can get nain for thinking oh my dearie I walk in it's just a little bit of it. He had many more love songs and some of them quite exquisite. And um, we, this year for the first time, 
didn't celebrate him by going out, but we still had our haggis and potatoes and turnips at home. And I have to confess, a little drop of whiskey to drink your health. That's how we do it. It's tea tonight, but I'll drink your health anyway. There's a distillery on the island of Skye. Of course, there's distilleries all over Scotland. Some people come to Scotland to do a whiskey tour. And um, they're usually in a bus. Don't worry, you're not allowed to go driving around doing this. And they do give you a little dram to taste, a little tiny glass to taste it. And um, as my grandfather used to say, there are no bad whiskies, but some are a lot better than others. And there are some between you and me that tastes so peaty that I wonder if there's any difference between the taste. They, they remind me of the taste of iodine, but there are some quite good ones. Um, and the one in Sky is not too bad at all. However, I would be unrealistic and I would be denying this, what does it mean to be human if I didn't admit that it has caused us a few problems? I'm afraid so. Yes, and um, I'm going to sing you a song about that. This one is one, one of the ones that has a happy ending, thank goodness, and it's called Farewell to Whiskey. I made a mistake once of singing it at a distillery dinner and they didn't invite me back. <laughs> but never mind, um, a little is fine, too much is not. So this is it, it's about um, well, the story speaks for itself. A woman who's, um, the word greeting comes in to it again, meaning weeping. And the only other word you need to know is wame means belly. Meal is referred to here is actually oatmeal. That's our staple diet. We eat it every day, oatmeal. So this is called now. So you can picture this. It's a dialogue between a couple possibly a fairly young couple. Johnny, my man, will you not think horizon? The days we'll spend and the night's coming on. Your silver's all gone and your stoop glass is empty before you. Oh, rise up, my Johnny, and come away. Was that I hear who's speaking so kindly? Oh, I can, it's the voice of my ain wifey Jean. Come out here, my dearie, come sit down beside me. Oh, there's room in this tavern for more than best me. Johnny, my man, your bairns are all greeting. No meal in the barrel to fill their wee wames. While you sit here drinking, you leave me lamenting. Oh, rise up, my Johnny, and come away. him. Do you know, remember the days we were courting? On a bed of primroses, we both did sit down. Sitting together in each other's company. You never thought it long then, not asked to go home. Johnny, my man, you know, think or rise Oh, the day is well spent and the night's coming on. Just think on the present or try to amend it. Or oh, rise up, my Johnny, and come away. 
Johnny roars up, I flung the door open. Oh, cursed be the tavern that first let me in. Oh, cursed be the whiskey, it leaves me all thirsty. So fare ye real whiskey, for I'm a walking. You can understand why the distillery didn't invite me back. But then again, I think that a lot of women probably have felt that way and have blessed the day when he said goodbye to the tavern. Um, like any other place, um, we make jokes about ourselves. I think the Scots are quite good at laughing at themselves. Over the last year, in fact, since the last March, which been quite difficult for a lot of us to find something to laugh at. So um, we began to reflect on it all. And some of the women were saying, do you know this? The only thing I can say about this lockdown is good is this. It's managed to achieve something that no woman has ever done. It's kept my man out of the pub, <laughs> out of the tavern. But anyhow, laughing aside, um, it, it's, it's, it's our way of, of getting through things. We make light of it. We make light of it. And this is what we have to do. And, and be ready to stop and say, now, what have we got to be thankful for anyhow? Well, a lot. Friendship, songs, laughter, all of those things. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I know there's going to be some questions, but I did promise you a song that is rooted in Taymouth. Well, this song deals with the other end of death and every area has their own funeral customs and one of ours is the lament. You share that too in America. Um, I remember being, I was in my teens actually when I when President Kennedy was shot. But I remember we didn't have a television. It hadn't arrived in our place yet, but we saw it on the cinema screen at his funeral. And they played a Scottish bagpipe tune, a lament at his funeral. Our late Queen Mother had the same, a, a, a lament at her funeral. And the lament is something that is it's very much akin to the blues and to the, the, if you like, black gospel as well, that total emotional expression through song. Because when no words can express your sorrow, only song can do that. And we share that. Now, this is a song about the daughter of Campbell, who, who the, the castle you saw there at Tamar's castle. And she was in love with a young man called Gregor McGregor. He was kin to Rob Roy McGregor. You may have seen that film or Rob Roy. He was an outlaw, a, a cattle rustler, and he was a, a quite a wild man, but he was he, he sort of robbed the rich to help the poor. That was his line. And this was a kinsman of his, Gregor McGregor. And he lived quite near there in the little glen by Loch Tay. Tay. And they were sweethearts, and, but her father wanted to her to marry somebody else, an arranged marriage and otherwise. We think of arranged marriages as belonging to other countries like India and other places. But in fact, Scotland had a long history of arranged marriages sometimes planned from the time the children were very small, very much akin to other countries. And when we look back there, tut, 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 arranged marriages. No, no, look at home first, Margaret. They had them here. And this song is absolutely typical. She was promised to a baron who was a wealthy nobleman, but she didn't want to marry somebody for the silks and satins. She said she would rather be turning cattle in a glen and living in a small, humble house with somebody she loved than to have all the riches in the world. That doesn't buy you happiness. And indeed, she did marry Gregor and she lived way up the glen in behind Tamouth Castle. And her father and her brothers plotted against him. 
and they ambushed him. And in front of her, this lovely young woman was actually cradling their child. They beheaded him at Taymouth Castle. A horrendous story, yes. And they put, not only that, they put his head on a stub of oak outside that castle. And she made this song and the year was 1575. The song survives and it's often sung as a lament, oh, not for such an awful deed as that, but even for the sake of loss, because what she expresses is that loss that it's the old story, the greater the love, the greater the loss. She says in it, I would over, I, I didn't want to marry the Baron with his silk and satins. I only wanted to be with Gregor, content in the glen. She says, the women of the glen might sleep, but here am I beating my fists on your grave. And it's got a, a chorus line which says, great is my sorrow, great is my sorrow. So I'm going to I'll end this part of it anyhow with that. It's a very sad song. And do come in with your questions afterwards because I've only skimmed the surface, gone from here to there and miraculously across three and a half thousand miles. So here's the song that is rooted in that part, Tamous. She song than that but that's just a little bit of it there's a saying too that if you can sing then you can live it helps you breathe singing is good for you and I'm going to close on one little saying or should, sometimes my American students ask me what's the main difference between Scotland and America and this is what I tell them well in America A hundred miles is nothing. And in Scotland, it's a long, 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 long way. In Scotland, a hundred years is nothing. And in America, it's a long, 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 long time. But we still share that quest of trying to find out what does it mean to be human? It means that we can share these things. And thank you for sharing tonight with me. Margaret, that was wonderful. Thank you. Those songs were just beautiful. Oh, thank you. 
did do you if there's questions shall i leave that to you katie and you can yes i'll field the questions for you so i do see one question that's already come through and um they're asking they're interested in learning gaelic and so uh, yes. if somebody was venturing to do that do you have any yes you can begin actually tomorrow because there in there's a course that has just been set up called Duolingo. They do it with other languages, they're Spanish and, and they've done that for years, but they've just launched a Gaelic one. So it's D-U-O Lingo. It's one word, just Google it, register it, and you'll get a daily lesson, how to pronounce it, how to say it, how to spell it. And then it, you can also go online to the, um, that, that one is, it will take you through the basics and um, I think introduces you to, to various little songs. And there's also a BBC website um, which begins and it and it takes you through little basic steps again with audio. And if you get really keen, in fact, I, I, I've had several students who become so that the American students completely fluent in Gaelic. They, yes, the head of the Celtic department at the University of Edinburgh is a an American, wow. the, and his colleague is is a Canadian. <laughs> yes, and um, there there are some what and there's some marvelous Gaelic speakers in the Glasgow University, the same, and they began literally the way that I've just described. There's a Gaelic college on the Isle of Skye now. There was no such thing in my day, and there's a lot of Gaelic schools in Scotland, but. Um, Actually, two years ago, I was singing at a Cayley. Cayley, by the way, just is now means like a little concert in a village hall, but it means really a visit. And there was a group of American uh, students on a on a, a a summer program in Scotland. No Gaelic, no interest in Gaelic either. But it was raining, so they came into the hall, and there we were singing. And and one of them said, "Wow, what's that? Can I learn it?" Well, that was five years ago. He's just finishing his PhD in Gaelic at Edinburgh. And he's an amazing, a total enthusiast, wears the kilt and everything. So you are very welcome to learn Gaelic and songs. Is that, are there any rolling of R's or are there? Um... Yes, um, it, not quite the same as we have in Scots. Scots is, is also another language. It's not identical to, link, to English, but it, it's it different enough. So you actually have to translate some of it. And, and it's in Scots that we get that R, it's a right cold freezing day. <laughs> anyway, in Gaelic, you do get the R, but not, not quite as, as, but you get a lot of the H sound like you have in here. And so for your word for lake, we would have loch as in loch Lomond. Okay. But, but if you can say Johann Sebastian Bach, you can say loch. Um, I'm not going to try and embarrass myself. <laughs> no, no, you, it's 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 quite. It, it's just a matter of practicing, and you know, you 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 start to learn what sounds come out of which part of your mouth. It can be quite fun. Um, I saw another question. If you know the story behind the sky boat song, yes. The Skyboat song was actually composed quite a long time after the episode of Bonnie Prince Charlie. And it was a, a man by the name of Paul. He was an Englishman actually who composed it, hearing the story. But it is based on the story of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, who came to Scotland in 1745 because he was the son of the one they believed should be the King of Scotland, James II. Um, this is a very, the saddest episode in Scottish history, dates to 1746, which was a big battle of Culloden, which is why many Scots fled to America, including to your own area. But that area, um, the prince came to Scotland to raise an army to capture, because they had put a German, a German on the English, on the throne of Great Britain. German was George of Hanover. And the reason they did that was the next of kin, the heir to the throne was James who was Catholic. And in the, in the previous 
century they had passed a rule that they would never have a Catholic king. Well, naturally, a lot of people said, this is ridiculous. He's the next of kin, the next of kin to the reigning monarch, the Stuart dynasty. And they, they, they removed him because he was Catholic for no other reason. And so when the queen they, they put there was Queen Anne, she was Protestant, a half sister, and she had no heir none except her half brother who was Catholic. And instead of having him, they sent for a distant cousin in Germany and brought him in. And that started the next, if you like, reign of the, the house of Hanover. Now that, the story behind it is that when the prince came and landed, he landed in the outer islands and then they marched south, they marched north. There was a disastrous battle in 1746 and the prince fled to the island of Skye, over the sea to Skye. And he had very loyal supporters, very, very, very loyal. And especially one young woman who actually uh, dressed him up as her, her maid and managed to escape with him. So he escaped to France. But that's what the song comes from. It's that story, speed bonny boat, like a bird on the wing. Speed bonny boat, like a bird on the wing. Over the sea to sky, carry the lad that was born to be king. Over the sea to sky. Now on the boat was Charles, who was son of James. So he would have been born to be king, but of course that never happened. So that's the story briefly behind it. That was a wonderful story. And Oh, one, I'm so glad that they asked that because I wouldn't have recognized that name, that it was a, a sky boat song. But when I heard you sing it, I know that melody. I know that it's tune. Very popular. I see another question. Uh, what might be some favorite films that express the stories or songs of Scotland that you love? Well... I'm very old fashioned here, you know. And I, I, I don't like scary things, but I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I do watch them sometimes if they have a sort of historical root. Brigadoon was a sort of classic. Everybody loved it because there's wonderful scenery, great acting. Now this is an old one. I think actually it's black and white, but it gives you that scenery of Scotland and that sort of magnificent splendor of, of the country. Um, there are what other Scottish ones? Yes, well, there's um, the one of Highlander. There's, there's one of oh gosh, me, Satan Flockton. Oh my word, what in the world is that film called? There's of course Braveheart. That well, that deals with the story of William Wallace. And and although it's not totally historically accurate, the one thing he that, that I have to commend Mel Gibson for is this. He managed to create that spirit of Wallace, which absolutely didn't back down. He was loyal to death, and the death was a horrendous death. And I would say this, that I was in a cinema, you might be interested in this, I was in a cinema when uh, that film was being, well, it was, it was on its first, you know, in every cinema. So I thought, well, I must go. And I had a letter from a dear friend in Texas said, oh, Margaret, wait till you see this. I've just seen it. It's this wrong. It's that wrong. It's the other thing. You are going to be so upset. Do you know what? I wasn't. Yes, they played Irish pipes. Yes. and they, <laughs> But I could forgive all of it because of the fact that he had the spirit of Wallace. And I saw something in a cinema I never saw in my life, either before or after. A standing ovation wouldn't do it. People were standing on the seat and they were going out of the cinema shouting what Mel Gibson did at the end or was, freedom! And actually, outside the cinema were people leafleting for the Scottish National Party. And it was, and yes, and that was about in the early 90s. And we did not have a parliament in Scotland then. We, our parliament was in London. The parliament was in Westminster. And from that time on, there were demonstrations in Edinburgh. They lit a fire every night, every night for democracy for Scotland. 
And it wasn't until 1999, about it's a good five or six years after Braveheart, that we finally got a parliament in Scotland. There had been no parliament in Scotland since the year 1707. But I would say, and, and people will argue with me, that actually Mel Gibson's role in Braveheart had an enormous, it, it made people sit up and, and, and because we'd had an election, mm -hmm. this is the background, we had an election and everybody was saying, oh no, not, not another Tory, you know, the, the, they do, the way they do with elections. And Scotland had had a really hard time. We lost all our coal mines. We lost, it, 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 was, a, it was a pretty rough time, a pretty rough time for Scotland actually. And um, I'm sorry to say it, but Mrs. Thatcher had very few fans in Scotland because she destroyed our coal industry. Our, and that was the, the livelihood of so many people. And, um, but everybody said they'd vote tactically and then they chickened out. And then we got it again. And then Braveheart came out and everybody related the two. I mean, that wasn't Mel Gibson's intention, I wouldn't think. But nevertheless, people sort of made that connection that we, you have to have that stand up for your convictions right till the end. He was a very honorable man. So that, I only mentioned two films. What else can I mention? It was, which one? Ross Roy. Roy, Roy. Rob Roy, yes. Rob Roy is pretty good too there. R Rob Roy, yes, Rob Roy has beautiful scenery. It's got the wrong songs in it, mind you, but it's got beautiful songs in it, although they didn't actually sing the ones to do with it. It's set in Perthshire, which is this area, it's that Taymouth area, and it's set in that whole view. It's a beautiful area. Um, but I should, if, if you'd like to visit Scotland, let me recommend that you just go online and type in Visit Scotland. And Visit Scotland is an organization which will take you on a little tour. And you can go on a little tour and visit Scotland. You've just done it tonight in a way. And um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but my favorite films about Scotland. There's a, one or two others come to mind, but I'll probably think, I, I didn't mention train spotting because my heart was in my mouth the whole time. He's acknowledging that Scotland has a drug problem. Train spotting is set in Edinburgh and it's absolutely, the the one film I did see, um, what was the one with the whiskey in it? I laughed and laughed and laughed. Whiskey galore. Oh, whiskey galore. Yes, you can watch whiskey galore. Yes, that's another one, and they'll all come tumbling back. Um, I do I do see Margaret that someone has asked about Outlander series. Okay, which is a popular one. Yes. <laughs> in in the have you seen that? I've got an awful confession to make. The first is no, and the second is that, uh, the second is, well, I have now, I've watched, uh, the second is I I had a, um, an email, it was about, it was quite a number of years ago now, maybe six, seven years ago, um, from somebody I never heard of, making a film I never heard of, asking me, about, <laughs> asking me if I would, if I would do a workshop to teach them how to do a, Song, Gaelic songs for shrinking the cloth for this film. It was going to be called Outlander. And um, I thought, oh, gee, I'm really busy. And I looked at my calendar and I thought, oh, hey, gosh, me. And it was coming up exam time and I thought, I've got a better idea. I'm a re I've got a really good student. Her name is Ainsley Hammer. And she has, she's got a wonderful voice. And she was in my Gaelic song class. And I've taught her lots of songs. So I'm going to, she, you know, she probably could do with 50 pounds or whatever they're going to pay for this. I'm sure. I had no idea. They said they would offer me a fee, but I thought, well, you know what? Money isn't everything. And so I said, I phoned her. I said, Ainsley, would you like to teach? Yes. She said, I said, well, they'll, they'll, they'll arrange. They'll pick you up, take you to the place. And, you know, you get a costume, all that stuff. And if you need anything, I just give me a call. So she phoned me. She said, Margaret, I can't believe you gave me this gift. She said, they offered me a pile of money. And I, 
And I, I said, well, good. It couldn't have gone to a better home, I said. And you've, done, and you've probably done a great job. So now I know about Outlander. My student told me who they were. And then, yes, I haven't read all the books, so, but I have read some. Yes, I have. It, it's an interesting idea to go back and forth in time. And the time they're going back and forth in is that boundary time of Culloden, which is, a, that was a very, it was a very much a, oh gosh, how can I express it? In 1746, they passed an act banning tartan, banning the playing of the bagpipes because it was an instrument that incited war, banning all weaponry, banning it, it, it was it was it was a horrendous and and if you offended now can you think of any other nation in the world, any nation, that had had their very clothing banned? To strip a person of their clothing is to strip them of their dignity completely. The Highlanders didn't have anything else, but it wasn't the tartan quite as we know it now. And the reason we have so many tartans, yes, they do have their associations with clans now, and there's some new ones too. But the way it arose in the old days is that people, they loved color. And the color of wool is not a practical color to wear if you're working. You, so they would dye it. Now, anybody who has dyed wool, or even anybody who knits and buys wool, knows that it's very difficult to get the exact same shade. Let's say you're blue. Well, you'll get blue all right, but will it be the same blue? And you'll see it. So the idea of not noticing the changes in the dye would be if you spread it out across your loom. You'll not notice if that one's there is different to that one there. So they would say, okay, I've got so much red and so much black, I'm going to choose that. So, and so much of this, so we'll put so many threads of that lot and so many of that. And then we'll do the same that way, which creates a tartan. We're not the only nation in the world who has, but we have rather commandeered it, have we not? And we do love our tartans. We do. We love our wool as well. So, um, it's, uh, this, you can visit tartan weavers. It's 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 it's, it's beautiful weaving. So did I did I have a question I was answering and did I lose it? <laughs> no, you, you cover you covered that one. Um, I do see another question asking about dirks. Yes. Well, um, were dirks a part of the history where you grew up, or yes. was that more in other parts? No, it was indeed my. I showed a picture of, um, at least I think I did, of the of the pipe band in in Sky. The pipe band. My father was a, a member of this pipe band. So, and they all wore a dirk in their stockings. Well, you can't. Yes, they had. They wore them. That was the thing. They would, and, and there there are the, the older ones had had the belted plate that stayed long with with, with various sizes of dogs, but it was fashionable, not just fashionable, it was practical. And many a time I've, I've, I've been, they didn't just wear the kilt for dress occasions. My father used to, uh, he used to wear the kilt on the hill sometimes. He would, he would sometimes go out shooting rabbits. We, it was, a, you know, sustenance for, everybody did this for the, for the, for the family. It was an extra meal. And, um, some people used snares rather than a gun. And if you needed to cut something, well, your dirk was in your pocket, uh, in, your, in your stocking, because they wore long woolen knitted stockings and you stuck the dirk in. The, the stockings were tied with it. With a, some, some were tied with sort of a, not an elastic garter, but with a tied garter, or it, laterally they were using elastic, but the, but the dirk was very firmly in your stocking. So they would use the dirk and stick it back in the stocking. It keeps your two hands free. And so, yes, it was, but it, things have changed now. The pipe bands still wear dirks. If you were to ask them to produce one, you probably find that they're wooden inside. They are no longer weaponry, um, but they certainly wear. Um, let's see. Is there an event that you favor educating about? An event. Mm 
or maybe a time in, in history? Oh, yes, well, I, I think that customs around the year and around the calendar are very important. Um, because they they take away they mark our time they take away from the everyday dullness and humdrumness of life if if that's what it might amount to for some of us even if you're sitting at a desk it can get you know very gosh me I'm still at this desk etc and we need things human beings need need to have time out of that so our calendar is marked with these times. Um, we celebrate Halloween, um, and I know that you do that or, uh, on the 31st of, of, no, of uh, October. Um, that was an old custom, but it's changed enormously now. There was no such thing as bought costumes, and there was no such phrase as trick or treat. It dates back, oh, in the midst of time, because they believed that Actually, that the Celtic calendar began on the 1st of November, the old Celtic year. And the eve before, all the Celtic customs began on the night before. So All Hallows Eve on the night before. But there was a belief that the whole world of the spirit world was, was undergoing changes and the returning spirits might come to visit the living on that night. So people used to dress up, they were afraid of that. They would dress up. So if a ghost, because they did believe in ghosts and people still do, if a ghost returned that and had some kind of revenge on you, well, you don't want them to recognize you, so you better dress up, wear a mask. Sometimes they were covered with, they were all homemade. Sometimes they would even sheepskin, they could be, or it could be as a ghost. If you were that bold, you can dress up as a ghost and pretend that you're one or a witch. They believed that the witches were about that night. They were quite scared of that night. And they burned a huge fire so that all evil would be burned away and you'd start again. Um, so we used to go around in our group and um, in my mother's day, well, they disguised their hands too because I, I know them for the fact that she knew just about every pair of hands in the village. She'd worked with all of them. If you're working in the field or whatever, you just, or you'd knitted with them, you would recognize the hands. So you'd have to put gloves on, or you, maybe you could, put, uh, you could put socks on your hands and, or anything. And then they would ask you to sing. So you wouldn't sing in your own voice. No, you were talking your own voice like this. Or something like that. And the rule was that when, when you, when they guessed who you were, you had to unmask, and then you had something to eat. So, it, but you, you, that was the sort. Of, but we played tricks as well. Um, I, now it would be called delinquency, I think, for some of the things that we did. But curiously, there was very little delinquency in in the islands then. Um, and I'm thinking of the outer islands. I lived in the outer islands for a while. And they had a, a night after Halloween when they would go around switching gates and things, playing tricks on people, big tricks. And um, then so people from outside of the island came in and they complained to the police that it was banned. And would you believe that that was a night, you see, everybody let off steam. Nobody, nobody, there was no accusations. You could take somebody's cow, you see, and take it from their cow, cow, cow barn and, and take it out and put it down the road in somebody else's and take their cow and put it in yours. And they would come out in the morning. That's not my cow and they'd have to go looking for it. But it was only on that night. And because youngsters get such a kick out of doing that nonsense, or you take somebody's gate off, put it down the road, shift somebody's horse, it could be anything. Um, and, but the, it was um, when they banned that, there was no night that people let off steam. And there was a sort of amnesty, no questions asked afterwards, who took my gate? Because if the, there was no point, because it, 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 they said, oh, it's a youngster, so I'll be, you know, we did it when we were young, that's what they said. So in a way, it, was a, it had its function. I don't know if I've explained it. First, actually, there's a reflection of how we spend the new year. We're not huge, big Christmas people, or we weren't until 
until we got huge supermarkets that tried to sell us, sell us, sell us everything and make us go into debt for Christmas. That was certainly not the case. Very, very little um, was exchanged for Christmas. New Year was the time and Hogmanay is the night, the last night of the year, the New Year's Eve. That's the big night when people would sit up. Now, everybody would clean their houses, top to bottom. Oh yes, that's the time when you clean down the back of the couch, the lampshades along the skirting boards. <laughs> Actually, it's quite a good idea, I think. When else am I going to get that lampshade cleaned? <laughs> but it was the idea that. starting a new... What do you call that? We call that spring cleaning. Well, yes. Actually, that's exactly what it is. And it feels really good to have a complete clean out. And we should do that now and again. It makes you feel good. And you're going to start again. And right, I'm not going to let that in the mess anymore, am I? Okay. <laughs> um, and and it's um, so that's the new year. And and again, we always brought it in with that. Okay. I, I see a question and I don't know. How how did the unicorn become the national animal of Scotland? Is that true? The lion and the unicorn. Do you know I can I cannot tell you we have we have the rampant lion on the flag, and we have two flags. I cannot tell you about the unicorn. It's a myth mythological creature that has appears in mythological stories and in the midst of time. And I honestly don't know where it comes from. And um, I know where we get our Psalter, which is the, the big at St. Andrew's cross that is on our main national flag now. And that um, it, it's the St. Saint, Saint Andrew's cross. It said that Andrew, the, the apostle, the, the, the saint was, was actually also crucified only he was crucified on a diagonal cross and when he died it was said that his um, his relics were taken to to sit to scotland and came ashore in a little place they now call st andrews in fife and there's all all long kind of legend about it we celebrate st andrews day and on the last day of november and it's a, it's a big celebration. You have a big St. Andrew's Society in, in, in Detroit, I think. You need to ask, I think so. And you need to ask them what about the, the other. But but the flag is, is but I, I'm sorry, I can't answer your unicorn question. I, I see a question that's asking if you've ever attended a Beltane festival. Yes, I have lots. Oh, yes. And it began, what, is, what is that? Well, it began in 1988 in Edinburgh. And I happen to know about this because the, the man who began it was a, was a, he was a musician actually by the name of Angus Parker and he spent some time in Spain. And he was at these amazing big loud festivals and he thought, why do we do this in Scotland? There must be another festival. And they did this in May. So he came along at the time I was a lecturer in folklore at the, at the University of Edinburgh and my speciality was customs. And he knocked at the door and he asked to speak to the customs person, that was me and another colleague. And we sat down and he said, well, what did they do at Beltane? I said, well, <clears throat> that's the first of May. They began the night before, it's a Celtic festival because that's half of the Celtic year. Halloween is at one bit and Beltane is the, is the next six months marking the next half. And it it was a time when they blessed the crops because they planted them and, they, and but they wanted, again, it was a time of purification. They lit a huge fire on the night of that, the last night of, of April. And it burned into the morning of May. And they, they lit it with a very special ritual, but. Scotland has two Beltane traditions. One is the fire, but the other is also water and, 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 and a floral festival from the Roman festival, Floralia. So I was trying to explain to him that in the lowlands, it was rather different, but they all believed that on the morning you bathed in the dew 
which was said to be the holy water of the Druids. So you lit the fire at night and that was, and they did, they did several things with the fire. They would, they would process, make a procession around the fire. And in some areas, they took their cattle all around the fire. And, and there was another variant on, they lit two fires and the cattle walked between the two fires. It was, it was a very, very specific. They now know, and science has now proved why they did that. That time of year is a time of year when the tick population, that's those horrid little things that cause horrid diseases. They are at their most lively. They're hatching out, they're catching on to animals. And by walking between the fire, they were instantly sizzled. Oh. The ticks, the cattle, they didn't linger there long enough to get burned themselves, <laughs> but, they, but they were close enough to the fire to do a great mischief to the ticks. So that was why they did it. Um, and then they would, they would have a, a night of feasting and dancing and so on. And in the morning, they would bathe in the dew. Now, the one, the Beltane festival combines all of these things. It, it chooses a Beltane queen. She dresses up in great floral everything, and she leads the pageant. It's now turned into, the first time we did it, or because I was part of it then, he, he asked me, would you come, would you sing at it? And I said, well, yes, I'll get some musicians. And we had, a, we had a wonderful time, actually. And all my students, every single one, they, they I said, no, no class tomorrow, we're going to this instead I uh, will meet you at 11 o'clock at night <laughs> instead it's rather like what I'm doing just now and then we'll go up to the top of the hill and actually we were there till four in the morning so there you are and and so the it, it is it goes on but in the morning that doesn't finish then then they cross over and they climb to the top of a hill in Edinburgh called Arthur's Seat and they watch the dawn the sun comes up about just back of four o'clock so they sit there and and the, the church actually has started joining in. At one time they banned it. That's why it died out. The church banned it because there was too much carousing and so forth and so forth. And the other thing was there was nothing in the Bible that says you should celebrate this. But the policy of the early Christian church was this. If we take away all the festivals, they will not want our religion. Instead, invest them with a new meaning, invest them. And so that that's what they did. The returning sun, think of the son of God, the returning light of the world, think of the light of the world. You want your crops to grow instead of thinking of it as a ritual, then bless your crops. And think of it as the, the water, the, we, we, we can't do any of this ourselves, you know. We can put the seeds in the ground, but we can not make them grow. We can water them, but this amazing thing happens when you do that. They grow. So it was all rolled up into that. And the Beltane Festival had their 20th anniversary, and I did attend. Was it, yes, two years ago, two years ago. And um, I have some photographs of it, and I was. Um, it, it's it now it's now ten thousand people attend, and you have wow. to get, and you have to get a ticket, and it's policed, of course. It's it's an amazing festival, actually. It's different every year. So if you have an aspiration to join the Beltian Festival, yes, I think you probably people come to Edinburgh from all over the world to go to that now. <laughs> Um, I do see a question that if if we were all to come to Scotland, would you promise to tell us more about <laughs> Scotland and the stories and the that tales? Would be wonderful. Yes, we could actually. Um, it, it, it's 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 there are actually some little tours that people do, um, and they're they're they try to be fairly cost efficient. They're not fancy. They take you know you might be. The accommodation might be a bunkhouse, um, but they're, they've got very good facilities, actually. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's one from Texas called Ed Miller's Tours of Scotland. If you're in Texas, that one is pretty popular. 
they come every year, uh, except last year they didn't come. And I usually join them. I go on their coach and we go to the Isle of Skye. We go to Culloden and I sing songs on the battlefield. Um, and it's, a, it's such a small country. I really do mean that 100 miles is a long way. It's only 40 miles between Glasgow and Edinburgh, but you can't think of two more different cities. It's only, wow. it's only about 200 miles from where I am to Skye, my island. But I couldn't go today and come back tomorrow. It would just take me too long. But it, because we, have, we still have some narrow, narrow roads and um, we're not talking about big highways here. But you get a bus to go along, a minibus. It's, it's quite a... Um, and there are some work programs for students as well. There's quite a lot on, available. Now you had met you had mentioned haggis at one point, and there's a question if if haggis is still popular and if you enjoy haggis. Yes, I do. Um, now, if I can ask my husband to go and get me a haggis out of the freezer, I have to have one there just in case I fancy one and a turnip, please. And I'll show you one this very minute. And yes, it is still popular. Um, I. I uh, when I had, when I was a lot young, uh, by the way, I'm, I, I am well over 70, you see, so I don't have the same energy as I used to have, but I used to um, spend some time with a group of American students from, where were they from? I think they were from, they were from Massachusetts, I think. Anyhow, they stayed in a big hostel place in Edinburgh, and we used to have a, a, a ha <laughs> well, this one's, this one's wrapped up, so here it is. It's got, it's, it's made, it's in the shape of a, it's kind of a, of a, Actually, it's got a, it's got some saran wrap, but forgive the saran wrap, but you can still see it's tied. It's the, it's the skin of the inside of the sheep's stomach, and it's stuffed with heart and liver and barley or an oatmeal and onions and cayenne pepper. And I was going to tell you, I had one student said, "Eh, I wouldn't eat that." I said, "Well, would you like to eat this? Okay, this is what's in winners, ears, trotters." Saltpeter, nitrates, heaven knows what, plastic, and here's a turnip. We we this is it's a, what do you call a swede perhaps a swede. We cook we we cook well peel it and chop it up and mash it, and we have that and 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 mashed potatoes and yes we do have haggis and it still is popular and we even have a poem we say to it. <laughs> when uh, we have a burn supper burns was a it's it was a poor man's food there's no question about it because you know even if it was a farm servant and worked um, and the, the best of the meat would have gone to the big house as it were and the servants would have the the, the lungs the kidney the liver etc but they made haggis and we love it So I also, I wonder, um, I know it's not technically part of the topic that we've been chatting about, which has been wonderful, but I wonder just real quick, would you mind sharing um, the state of things in Scotland right now as it pertains to maybe the lockdown or um, how COVID-19 has affected Scotland? Very seriously, actually, um, we the, the 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 law the law we still come under the the British government, the Westminster government. In other words, the Prime Minister, who's uh, Boris Johnson, and but there are separate laws for Scotland as well. There have been discrepancies between the two, which have made from Scotland's point of view, made for great difficulties. The, the lockdown has been stricter and they've been pressing for a lockdown that would, um, and, and in fact, our, our ratios are, are a lot better than they are in England. And in fact, in, in any of the other countries of the British Isles. Um, but nevertheless, there's still, it's still not good enough. For example, um, and there's been very tragic cases with care homes, especially ones that are run by um, a consortium, a, a business, for example, that is situated in the south of England that has 50 care homes, and one of them is on the Isle of Skye. 
so the Isle of Skye is an island, it's going to be very safe. Well, no, not if they bring in relief staff who've just been working in a care room in London. They bring it to Skye and the next thing, 15 of the old people are dead. It's been tragic and we've had a lot of that. Um, it's, we are in a tight lockdown just now. We're not allowed to go from county to county. Um, and in other words, our, we're not allowed to go further than our nearest village to go shopping to the supermarket or you get fined. They will impose a fine. Um, so if you, um, there's, oh, there's been quite a number of fines and, and if people uh, defy the fine, they get a bigger fine, up to a thousand pounds, which is a lot of money. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, the, there's a, we have a, a quarantine law passed in Scotland for flights coming in um, from, from other countries, except the British Isles, you can fly. However, so it means that if you, if you were to fly from say New York to Edinburgh, you would have to quarantine for 10 days at your own expense, by the way, in a hotel, it should be about 1700 pounds. But what is happening now, it, the law is different in London, in, in, in England. They only have a list of some very seriously infected countries and America is not on that. So you could fly from America to London and you don't have to quarantine. Then you can fly to Scotland. There's the loophole. So we have a sort of test case now and uh, our first minister is pressing for better, tighter restrictions because actually they were so lax, they were so slow in London to actually act on it, that it has been disastrous. We're, we've had, gosh me, what are we at? 70,000 70, deaths? No, 100,000 100, deaths. A year ago, we hadn't heard of it. Um, right. 100,000 deaths. And, and you uh, said the population of Scotland is 6 million? Yeah, <laughs> yes, and we have had uh, over 6,000 deaths, yes. Um, it's in some areas much more serious than others. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I don't see any other questions. Margaret, this has been so wonderful. I cannot thank you enough. And, and I would like to thank everybody that joined us tonight, um, that joined for the Humankind event tonight, taking some time with us, maybe having a, a hot cup of tea with us, which was wonderful. Um, again, thank you so much, Margaret. Well, thank you. I love the idea of reflecting on what it means to be human. And even in this pandemic, I mean, we have an awful lot of complainers, I have to say. But I just find that, you know, we're all in the same boat. If each day, no matter what, we can get up and say, now that what can I say thank you for today? I can say thank you because I'm going to see you this evening. Well, I can say thank you for this evening. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, if you didn't get the questions, wait now. There's a little, is that another one on the bottom? I just flew onto the screen. Um, oh, oh, a weaving dance. Oh, was that a dance one? Was it a Beltane festival? Um, was it weaving? About weaving? Oh, I think it is in the chat. Yeah, uh, do you that? know the weaving song uh, from one of the aisles that is danced? There's a weaving that yes, there's a there's a dance called the Hebridean weaving dance, and <laughs> there's a lot of Hebridean dances, and it sort of goes out sort of an in and out, so you get as opposed it's it's mimic, mimicking the 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 way a weaver does, um, with the with the the warp and the weft, so they do these figures of eights and back and forth in a very, um, a lot of the dances they, they do invent dances as well. They're beautiful. The Royal Society of Scottish Country Dance, it only dates to 1923 when it was formed based on dances that had been handed down from tradition. A lot of dances from tradition. And they were, if you like, once you start writing them down and, and, and um, noting them, 
then you know you have the variations it's the same dance is the same dance what's that one there oh i lost that one but Something. different music from the denmark oh oh it may well be no the tunes I, I honestly can't tell you what tune is played to it because if it's the tune will read read to a tempo. Scottish dance music, usually an accordion and fiddle band, is very, very popular. There's regular programs on the radio. And in fact, even in my childhood, when we only had battery radio, it was on for two things, the news and the Scottish dance music. And all the chairs went back in the kitchen. And everybody danced in the house every Saturday night. As children, my grandfather would get up and dance too. Yes, that old man you saw in the picture. He loved it. And so, um, simple pleasures. So if you so, dance, yeah. Well, I, um, it is pa well past midnight your time, I'm sure now. Well, it is. It's it's in fact, Bracken done, Bracken, Bracken. Dun, ten, ten, dun. Dun, dun. Oh, I know it. You're not singing, are you? Brochen lam, tana lam, brochen lam is uen. Brochen lam, tana lam, brochen lam is uen. Brochen lam, tana lam, brochen lam is uen. Brochen lam, satana lam, sa brochen lam is uen. Is that the one you mean? That's it. Oh, there you go. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could dance it to that tune. And played in the fiddle accordion or just sung. <laughs> well, again, Margaret, thank you for staying up late with us and thank you for sharing all of your expertise and all of the folklore and your your songs were absolutely beautiful. Thank you for inviting me, Katie, and for having the faith that it's all going to work out. And thanks to the tech as well. Yes, thank them all. So everybody, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.